This is the Check It Out podcast from the Moraine Valley Library. I'm Troy. I'm Tish. And today we're going to talk about the musical Alexander Hamilton, which is our upcoming one book, one college text. We are here with Craig Rosen, the coordinator of academic theater and faculty member. Hi, Craig. Hello, Troy. And we're here with Tommy Hensel, the director of the Fine and Performing Arts Center and also a faculty member. Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, to start us off, I would, wanted to turn to Tish to maybe describe the musical um, Hamilton for those who may not know. Uh, Hamilton the Musical is a Broadway play by Lin-Manuel Miranda, who famously got the idea for this um, by reading Ron Chernow's biography of Hamilton while on the beach on vacation. Um, he transformed this biography into a dynamic Broadway show that showcases Hamilton's rise from being an immigrant in New York to one of the major founding fathers. He's active in the Revolutionary War, um, creates a close-knit band of friends, um, marries very well off, and connects with Washington, which really changes his life and pushes him into, into history. And this move to, towards history um, includes being the Treasury Secretary, um, but it also includes his personal life getting really a lot of attention. So when he cheats on his wife um, and comes clean about it in the public, he kind of falls from grace. There's, in the musical, a lot of drama that's created both by his connections with Washington, his marital affair, and then his eventual duel with Aaron Burr, where he dies. Um, it's thrilling. It's exciting. It makes history accessible, partially because the actors that are portraying our founding fathers are not played by old white men. They're played by people of color. And this was really intentional to connect the history of our country to the way America looks today. So it's a vibrant, exciting play happening on Broadway, getting a lot of attention, and, and soon to be coming to Chicago. The quick snapshot. Maybe we can turn to our theater experts, and uh, maybe you could help set the context. So this is on Broadway, and it's a smash hit. And, but it, it connects with the traditions of Broadway and musical theater in some really interesting ways. And maybe you can help open our eyes to what that looks like. Well, I think um, so much has been made of this being sort of revolutionary because of the way the show is cast, because of the use of, of music, of popular contemporary music, most notably hip-hop, but not everything is hip-hop characters speak or sing in ways that are more organic to the char to the character. Um, the young women, the love interests sound like sound like Beyonce could be singing uh, those songs. King George sounds like he's an 80s uh, British pop uh, singer. So a lot has been made about sort of the form uh, uh, the form of it, who's telling the story, what kind of music is it? but there's also something very traditional in it. Um, in a sense, it's a rocky story. It's an underdog <laughs> making his way up through the ranks. It's um, a story of Les, of Les Mis or Les Miserables, of people fighting a revolution, becoming fr uh, becoming friends throughout. There's, of course, a love story involved in it. Um, it's a common character that we're familiar with on some level. Just about all the characters in the play I know I'm more familiar mm -hmm. with than Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. I know Thomas Jefferson. I know George Washington from growing up. So it's also the story of one man's perspective, and it's told in flashback, like many things, uh, mm -hmm. like many things are. So there's a lot of commonalities between um, other major important theater pieces through the world and that throughout history. And then there's also this new way of telling the story. So they kind of merge together um, with the familiar to most of us, but also the unique to many of us. Mm -hmm. So I think those things sort of uh, are what make it kind of a common part of our society today, mm -hmm. things that we can all associate with or have knowledge of and things that might touch new people who haven't typically attended theater. Mm -hmm. right. And I think one of the things that uh, we forget is that Broadway musicals have always responded to popular music. So the music of Broadway has almost always been whatever music was popular in that time period has formed the basis <laughs> for the musical. So it makes sense that as we moved into the 90s, uh, we had Rent, for instance, in 1996. 
uh, that uh, has a very similar trajectory to Hamilton in the theater world. It won 12 Tony Awards. It won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Hamilton just won 11 Tony Awards and a Pulitzer Prize. So there's a parallel there, uh, and they're exactly 20 years apart. But in the 90s, the music of Rent was kind of the popular music of the time. Uh, yeah. And I was going to say, and similarly, in the 60s, Hair came along which was a rock musical in 67, 68. We're talking about the time of Woodstock, and we moved from musicals like Fiddler on the Roof or before that West Side Story to the new popular music of the time. So hip-hop and rap being uh, the music of this generation, Mm -hmm. while it's unique, the idea of music and the musical moving forward together really isn't too unique. It's the music of the time. I mean, and think of all the Disney musicals using sort of you know, easy pop music. It, they're, they're not, they don't sound like Rodgers and Hammerstein because that's not what people wanted to hear. So I think, you know, from a musical perspective, it, it's breaking ground in many ways because there aren't a lot of uh, people who are brave enough to put a show that's that visceral and that contemporary on stage. Um, and just Craig knows this also is, you know, technically it's called a Broadway musical only because it's on Broadway. The, uh, it's, uh, it would be an off-Broadway musical if it were in a different theater. But we also have this concept of what Broadway means. Symbolically. It's, it's a symbolic thing. So the fact that it is on Broadway is hugely symbolic because it does, even though it does follow traditions uh, of musical theater, it's using uh, a, a dramatic story. It's being told in flashback, as Craig said. Uh, the, the characters are familiar. Uh, it's not breaking new ground in the sense of telling a, a story that we don't know. Uh, it's breaking new ground because it's actually telling the story that we know, but using, as Tish said, um, what we look like now. We're not mm-hmm. casting all old white men um, fighting the Revolutionary War. They're suddenly showing on stage what America looks like today. And I think that's one of the things that's making it so popular is that people, no matter who you are, you can walk into that theater and sit in that audience and you can see yourself Mm -hmm. on that stage. And that's important. Um, Many Broadway shows are not like that, as we know. And so you sit there in the dark and you enjoy the show, uh, but you may not see yourself on stage. I think it would be hard, anyone would be hard pressed not to sit in that audience and and see themselves up on that stage somewhere. Right, right. In our prep for this, I know, Craig, you had mentioned the concept of colorblind casting and how that's been used in different ways. Could you maybe talk about that? Because I think that's relevant to Hamilton. Sure. Um, As as theaters moved forward, of course, most of the plays have been written by white white writers. Um, Usually the characters have been written for or with white actors in mind. I think that's fair to say. So something came along, and the popular phrase has been colorblind uh, casting. So what that means, it kind of goes in various steps. Usually we think of it as let's just cast the best actor for the role. And so we're watching a family on stage, and if the best person to play um, to play a father happens to be someone with a Japanese heritage, that's great. If his daughter is from another heritage, if the mother's from another, the audience can make the leap and understand that actors are telling a story, that we're watching actors portray other roles. So it's a way to open up casting to, um, to become more inclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what, that's uh, one way we can use colorblind casting. Then there's sort of, if you were to go along a continuum, a way to say, let's do Romeo and Juliet, and let's make all of Romeo's uh, family African American. Let's make all of Juliet's family um, Caucasian. And let's kind of impose that part of the reason these families don't like each other deals with race. Eventually it becomes a musical, becomes West Side Story, but not with those, uh, not with those ethnicities, of course. So here we're still using people that might have been written for one ethnicity and we're superimposing another, but now we're telling, it's becoming part of the story. And then you get to something like Hamilton, which is written to have people of various backgrounds and ethnicities tell this story. It's making a political and a social statement about America and who and who we are. Sometimes it's also done with gender, uh, an important Pulitzer Prize winning play, Angels in America. The playwright 
uh, says, I want exactly this male actor to play these roles. Some are male and some are female, so on and so forth. Right. So something similar happens with, can happen with gender, but um, that notion of casting uh, people of color in various roles kind of takes that uh, continuum. And then there are, of course, plays written for people of specific ethnicities or nationalities, and that's part of the point of the text. So we kind of right. move it that way. So this may not necessarily be colorblind, but perhaps... Um, purposefully, like, aware, conscious of, of making a statement and I through th who they cast. I think it is. I think this was a very conscious decision, uh, and I think, you know, Tish brought it up earlier that, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda was consciously saying, look, what does America look like today? Let's mm -hmm. look around us as we walk through the world, and it's it's diverse, it's an, and it's a, a very – um, multiracial, multi-ethnic world in America today. So I think that's one of the things he wanted to put on stage. And also, I think uh, it's it's a way for younger people, you know, through the music first of all, because hip hop, as we know, is a very popular art form, particularly in the millennial generation. But for them to come in and actually learn something historical and and get some information that maybe they need to have without mm -hmm. kind of knowing they're getting it. I think one of the things that makes this powerful is there's so many themes and, and stories there that are important for us to remember today because we're living through many of them again. Uh, and this is a, art is a very powerful way to be able to, to bring those narratives out without feeling like you're being didactic as mm -hmm. you're doing it. So in a way, in a good way, art is subversive. You know, you, you get your point across through the avenue of entertainment and through appealing to emotions, uh, and they learn something sometimes. You learn something in a show, and you're different when you leave it without really knowing that that happened to you. Right, right. Could, could we, just to uh, shift a little bit, let's get to, and we hinted at this, why is it so big? Like, why is this musical taken off the way that it has? You know, first and foremost, it's really good, <laughs> and I, I, I hate to be, to break it down to something so so simplistic, but it we could talk about all these ingredients, and you could put it on something that's not. So, kind of first and foremost, it's really, really, really good. Everything from the lyrics and the music to to saw it on Broadway to uh, the performances to the scenic design. It's a strong conceptual piece. Um, I like using a phrase in my class, which um, has been passed down through generations, and that's kind of great art is universal and specific at the same time. Um, Shakespeare, the same thing. We understand specificity in Shakespeare of the time, its period, the stories, but the themes are universal. And we've talked about that a little bit with this show. It's specific. It's very American. We don't know what's going to happen when it opens in London. Mm -hmm. How much of this story do, uh, do the British know? How much of it is really important? important to that audience to know. So something very specific about being Amer about being American, about making your way up, about fighting your way to uh, to the top, to that face that we're so familiar with on a ten dollar on ten dollar bill. So it's specific and universal, as Tommy said, you sit in the audience and you see yourself up there. And not just in, in um, physical appearance, but also where you are. Are you someone that gets involved in, in this case, the revolution? Are you someone who sits back and tries to kind of go, you know, go with the flow and wants fame without um, really investment in it? Mm -hmm. So I think, besides from just the quality, there's something very specific, very universal, and that lets us learn about a time period and learn about ourselves, which goes along with what Tommy was saying. You know, I, and uh, not to sound too esoteric, but I also feel like the timing is very important on this piece on a number of levels. First of all, I think the political climate in the United States has made this piece more relevant than it might have been four or five or six years ago. And eight years ago when Lin-Manuel Miranda did In the Heights, uh, which had similar form, hip-hop, rap, uh, very interesting multicultural casting uh, – that show won some Tony Awards, and it had some success, but nothing like Hamilton, uh, partially because it was very specific to talking about the Washington Heights neighborhood, and most people don't even know where that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, it didn't hit the universal themes in a way, that, as Craig said, that this one did. So I think, first, uh, the current political climate has given this show uh, an extra push. But also, Craig talked about this briefly about gender, um, we we started to see in the last few years a shift on Broadway towards more of a focus on trying to create inclusion. 
Uh, we've seen that with uh, some gender issues on Broadway recently. We're seeing it with racial issues. And I think that people, whether they know they're doing it or not, are in instinctively responding to the power of the underdog. This, this show is, is fascinating in the way that it was constructed financially. It was constructed in a very different way than most Broadway musicals. Most people wouldn't know this unless you're in the industry. But um, the, everybody involved with this show is sharing the profit, not mm -hmm. just the investors, mm -hmm. but all the designers, all the actors, all of the creative team. They, they all are going to continue to make money forever um, based mm -hmm. on this show. This is not a normal pattern on Broadway. And I think that whether people know it or not, you feel that vibe. Sometimes when Lynn manuel Miranda talks about this show and his passion about the show and when you see the actors discuss their roles and you see the designers talking about what they've done, there's this sense of we're, we're new, we're fresh, we're different, and we're the underdog and we're coming out and we're going to take the world by storm. And I think that people really respond to that in a period when we're feeling very cynical and depressed on a societal level when they see something like this that is exuberant and new and exciting, it, it draws their attention. So I think that the timing has been part of the success of the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. It's only been on Broadway since August. It's had less than 400 performances. So, you know, it, it's not like it's been running forever. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's achieved this level of success and fame in less than a year. Can we bring this to our campus then as a one book text and how – what does it mean for us to access this play and talk about the themes in this play and how should we go about that? Well, when – you know, Troy, Troy knows this, of course. Troy, when uh, the library made the decision to go this route, he approached me and approached Tommy about this. And I'm sure Troy thought that I was going to jump for joy. Oh, my God, we're using a dramatic text to tell a story. Um, you know, it's not Death of the Salesman, nor is it Othello, and I'm the theater guy, and I must <laughs> be thrilled. And I said to him, I think that's not a good idea. And I know I don't think Troy was very happy with that. Um, we were happy to ignore you. You were happy right. to ignore it. That's, that's <laughs> but, no, but you had a good point. You bureaucracy good point. at yeah. work. Yeah. Um, but because for me, being the theater person, it's about that live performance. And just reading a, a straight play like Death of the Salesman, yes, we can get something from the text. But performance is still what theater is. And then something as spectacular as this, yes, we can read the, uh, the text of the lyrics. We can hear the way it's put together. But um, Tish and I were talking. She just saw it on Broadway. And the experience of attending theater is something – unlike anything else right. as I plug theater itself. So, uh, you know, as, as a text... And I think that's important to bring up. I mean, I think that's a great point that we sh shouldn't lose within this study for this year. And, and yeah, yes, and, you know, we can even show videos of some, of some of it, but that's not the same as, att as attending theater. There's nothing like attending it. So for me, um, the most important part for me is looking at it theatrically. Fortuitously, it's about to open in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately... It's almost impossible to uh, right. to get to get tickets, but for me, it's the kind of inclusion of theater in what we talk about, and that is something we don't necessarily talk about. So the more for me, we can embrace the live aspect of it. That's key and important uh, for me, um, and that's just my one niche, I guess. Yeah, um, I think you know, for the relevance on campus, there's a number of things. First of all, uh, the uh, They've chosen to focus so much of this story of this musical. You know, it's based on an, an epic book. And, you know, the book is very long, uh, and a lot of the book is focused on politics, as it should be. But they've extracted the story in such a way that they really focus more on the people, which I think is important in a in a musical and in a play because it's the story, the narrative of the people that's going to drive you. And I think that they focused a lot on the immigration piece of Alexander Hamilton's life. And I think so that immigration piece, that piece of being someone from outside coming to America and becoming American and still maintaining um, those loyalties of, you know, how do I maintain a loyalty to who I was and who I am, my, my new country? Uh, and in the case of Alexander Hamilton, also we have the issue of loyalty to his wife 
and then not into his family and not into his political party and not. So it's all of those issues that we struggle with today. So immigration, I think, is a huge piece that can be relevant to the campus. Obviously, um, one of the things I love about this show is that it takes history and it makes it exciting. So I'm sure the history faculty is jumping up and down for joy that we, you know, we can finally explain to people that history is not this dry, dull, dusty thing. It can be an exciting, visceral mm -hmm. um, exploration of themes that are still going on today and recurrent themes through the history of American politics So I think in American cultural history. So I think those pieces are very relevant uh, to, you know, and as we've all sort of touched on briefly, sort of on the side, the psychological side, there's also that fascinating exploration perhaps through our psychology departments and sociology of how does somebody who has such brilliance in one area of their life mess things up so badly in another area of their life and what's the trajectory of someone's decisions that, that lead them um, down this path? I think that's a fascinating well, that, I mean, and that's, I mean, that's a Shakespeare Play, yeah. Right. I mean, we see the or Oedipus, if you want to go further, we see this person who can reach great reach greatness. It's the tragic hero who can reach greatness and they make choices that also lead to that lead to a downfall. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, they were able to make this character, this sort of epic, tragic hero um, throughout, which is very human. Um, so we can read these other plays like Oedipus or Hamlet Hamlet and see these as old and stodgy. Here we get a character who goes through a similar journey, but they can be very human and very modern, I think. Is and right. he's a real person. It, you know, this is, it isn't Oedipus or Hamlet. This is a real person, and this is the real story of their life, which I think is relevant. You know, hey, mm -hmm. this is not just, you know, Oedipus or Hamlet, some imaginary character that was created. This is a real person who had a real life, and I think that visceral connection mm -hmm. is important. Yeah, I mean, and just one last thing, because I know we're running out of time, is I don't know, I don't know if I want to ask or not, how the history department is reacting to this. You could, I could see kind of like the way I looked at it is, is this a Cliff Notes pop glossy version of somebody who, who has a greater story to tell? I know Ron Chernow, who wrote the novel, was in, was, has been integral in developing the script to, to leave the authenticity. But much like my point of view was about theater, I could see someone else saying, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. In two hours, these people are going to sing through this, this <laughs> important story. I don't mean to be cynical, and I hope they're not cynical. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, maybe it, it's a platform to a bigger discussion okay. also. And that's a great advertisement for the fact that we're going to sit down with our historians and talk about it. So... If you're listening to this on our YouTube channel, there will be a talk with our historians on that channel. Or if you're listening to this in our podcast feed, um, right around it will be a piece by our historians thinking just about that. Great. I wanted to give a quick plug. Um, Craig and Tommy will be talking about the Broadway musical uh, for us in October. Uh, that talk is going to be the Broadway musical, the quintessential American art form. That will be in the library October 13th at 11 a.m. And we'll be promoting that. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank you both for this talk. I think uh, it's going to be a fun year. So with that, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for listening.